I don't have to indulge upon you to stand once again. I want to read the word of the Lord, and then once we have done that and prayed, uh, you certainly are welcome to your seats from the book of Exodus for just a few fleeting moments on this day. Those of you that have come fully attired in the armor of the Lord and have your swords, if you'll open them, the book of Exodus chapter 29. When you have it, say amen. The text reads as such, and this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hollow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office, take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil. Of wheat and flour shalt thou make, shalt thou make them, and thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with the water. And thou shalt take the garments, and put upon Aaron the coat, and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod, and the breastplate, and the gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Seventh verse says, Then shalt thou take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. I want to argue for a few moments today simply from this subject, the anointing. And pray, you'll pray with me. Now, God, we thank you. As you have done in days past, do once again. Bless this gathering of saints in this holy place. Feed us with bread from on high and cause the people of God to hear your word. If, you, if you'll speak, Lord, we will hear. And if we hear, Lord, we shall obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart that loves God just shout amen. amen. Come on, clap your hands as you take your seats in the presence of our King. We honor the Lord on this day of our holy convocation and uh, so grateful to be uh, with the saints on this side of eternity. Certainly want to give deference and honor to the greatest leader uh, and I'm so appreciative for Bishop Charles Edward Blake, presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ. Let's celebrate our leader. I'm honored, Bishop, and I'm humbled for the opportunity to share on this day and the trust that you have uh, placed in me and um, the lives of our conventions within the Church of God in Christ, and I certainly don't take that for granted, sir. We honor Bishop P.A. Brooks and uh, Bishop Jerry Macklin and the members of the general board, uh, those that are here with us and those that are elsewhere. We honor, in our absence, Mother Willie Mae Rivers, uh, not only the supervisor of the women's department, but my own jurisdictional supervisor, and we thank God for her. God bless the assistant supervisor, Mother McCoo Lewis, and we're grateful for her. To the fragrance of our church, uh, we honor the lady of our church, Lady May Blake. To Bishop Sheard in his absence and to the Board of Bishops, to uh, my own bishop, Bishop Johnny uh, Johnson, uh, grateful for uh, my church family, uh, those that are here, and I know some are doing what they shouldn't be doing, and at work they're streaming and watching. Uh, just don't get caught, I praise God. Uh, I'm grateful that I have two ladies that make up the Kershaw household, uh, one of which is said that we are perfect in each other's eyes, and that's my one and only daughter, Rachel Victoria Kershaw. Glad for her. Just stand or wave your hand wherever you, bless your heart. And to the fragrance of my house and our ministry there back in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, one of the speakingest, I don't know if I can use the word preachingness in this setting, one of the speakingest young evangelists, uh, Maxine Yvonne, formerly Green, now Kershaw. Just come on, bless your heart.
As most of you know, I come from the backside of conventions, the areas of which um, we're running around here and there, the preparation that has to go forth. And uh, I was thinking of a way to acknowledge those members of the various teams that I have the great joy of either supervising, managing, or working with. And uh, some of them are here. I see uh, some of Command Central is over here, Bishop Willard Payton and that Command Central crew, my Memphis staff, some of those are here, and uh, some are in registration working, our housing group that uh, we contract with, that we work with. And I thought the best way to tell them how much I appreciate them and to share with you that nothing like this happens just by showing up. And it takes a lot of people, a lot of cooperation, a lot of working together. And uh, so I read a story about an insurance claim. A man was injured on the job and he filed an insurance claim. The insurance company requested a little bit more additional information and so the man wrote the insurance company a letter uh, uh, explaining the circumstances which had happened. He writes, Dear Sirs, I'm writing in response to your request concerning clarification of the information I supplied in block number 11 on the insurance form which asked for the cause of my injury. I answered in the block trying to get the job done. I trust that the following information will be sufficient for my claim. I'm a bricklayer by trade and on the date of the injury I was working alone laying brick around the top of a three-story building. When I finished the job, I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than to carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to put them in a barrel and lower them by a pulley that was fastened to the top of the building. I secured the end of the rope at ground level and went back to the top of the building, loaded the bricks into the barrel and pushed it over the side. I then went back down to the ground and untied the rope, holding it securely to ensure a slow descent of the barrel. As you will note in block number six of the insurance form, I only weigh 145 pounds. At the shock of being jerked off the ground so swiftly by the 500 pounds of bricks in the barrel, I lost my presence and forgot to let go of the rope. Between the second and the third floors, I met the barrel. This accounts for the bruises and the lacerations on my upper body. Fortunately, however, I retained enough presence of mind to maintain my tight hold on the rope and proceeded rapidly up the side of the building, not stopping until my right hand was jammed in the pulley. This accounts for my broken thumb. See block number four. Despite the pain, I continued to hold on tightly to the rope. Unfortunately, at the same time, the barrel hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed about 50 pounds. And I must once again refer you to block number six where my weight is, is listed. It was at that point I began a rapid descent. Again in the vicinity of the second floor, I met the barrel once again coming up. This explains the injuries to my leg and my lower body. Slowed only slightly, I continued my descent, landing on the pile of bricks. Fortunately, my back was only strained. I'm so sorry to report, however, that at this point, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. I trust this answers your question Please note that I am tired and finished with trying to do the job alone. I could never do this alone, and I appreciate our staff. Come on, thank God for these that work behind the scenes. All right, time to get to the business at hand. God bless Bishop Thomas. I appreciate your introduction, and I've had the pleasure of working with Bishop Thomas here in the center uh, since 2010 and appreciate his great love uh, ethic and uh, working cooperatively with us. Look at somebody and repeat this once again. Tell them the anointing. For a few moments on this day, I want to stick to the basics and talk to our sanctified church 
about the anointing. If I were to do as others would do and ask you to touch your neighbor and ask them if they were anointed, those that were not asleep or antisocial would certainly declare that they are anointed. And so it may seem unnecessary, yet it's vital that we spend just a few moments today talking about the anointing. The anointing is something that we spend time talking about and preaching about and singing about and debating and even trying to figure out as to whose life has oil on it and whose does not. I believe that the one thing that each of us can agree with is that if we're going to have power over the enemy, we're going to have to have the anointing. Devils are not such that you can rationalize with them. You cannot inter, inter, uh, intellectualize with a devil. You've got to have power to cast a devil out. It's not just a preacher thing. It's not just a singer thing. It's not just a missionary thing. It's not attached to the title that you might have or the clothing that you might wear or even the pedigree from which you might come. I hate to disappoint some, but just being a second or third or fourth generation Church of God in Christ member does not mean you have the anointing. It might work for elections, but it doesn't always work with the devil. I'm in trouble already in here. The truth is that most of us need more than just the outfits that we have spent more than we'll put into the offerings during the course of this week. We need more than just sharing in the sweet kanoya, the sweet fellowship of seeing our friends and our colleagues from across the country. We need more than just fighting for the prime seats in the house that oftentimes we vacate before the benediction is even given. I believe that your success in life is contingent upon having the Holy Ghost. And so if you don't mind, for a few fleeting moments on this day, I want to just argue a bit about the anointing. And I want to begin, however, with talking about what the anointing is not. It's not just mere talent and ability. It's not just the capability of squalling in the right key. It's not just running the chords if you're a singer and being able to move from one note to the next note. It's not just professionalism and having a, the ability to stand before people and in great eloquence be able to share with them and talk with them. It is not the external show that sometimes we see even among us. It's not under, just the understanding of, of homiletics and hermeneutics. It's not even your position or your authority. It's not just uh, uh, the recognition that you might have by your pastor or the superintendent or even uh, your bishop. It's not college degrees and uh, the capacity to matriculate through the institutions of higher learning. Uh, the truth is that the anointing is not what you do. It is not something uh, that happens by being in uh, the right service. It's not just uh, because you attended the Holy Convocation in St. Louis. It's not because you have paid a sacrificial offering and have come among us. It's not because you're wearing a collar that's turned around or have a cord around your neck. Uh, look at somebody and tell them that's not the anointing. <laughs> to be anointed, one must go through a process of being qualified. Look at somebody and tell them, you got to get qualified. Being anointed is an intentional act. It doesn't happen just because you showed up at, uh, in a certain setting. It does not happen coincidentally or haphazardly. To be anointed is a purposeful, intentional act that must happen in the life of the believer. The God that we serve is a God of purpose, and whatever God does, he does it with a purpose in mind. 
whether it's being blessed, whether it is a trial, whether it is a temptation, whether it is a struggle, whether God is causing you to wait when you want to go, whether it's an issue that you just uh, are having to learn and learn the hard way, all of these have a purpose in the life of the believer and the anointing of God is something uh, that is done uh, intentionally. Look at somebody and tell them, uh, if you're going to get anointed, it's going to be intentional. Make no mistake, you're here at the convocation with purpose. I, your purpose might differ from why God has you here, but you are here with a purpose. Because God does not have you breathing his air and drinking his water and eating his food for nothing. You're on the planet with a purpose in mind. I like what the psalmist declared that we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made and that it comes with a purpose and I'm going to argue for just a moment or two that the that the anointing of God the process and the pace everybody say process and pace are y'all praying with me here today I believe that the anointing of God begins with God doing something to a yielded vessel it's God who anoints us and that according uh, to a divine pattern. You might, you might remember that in the book of, of Exodus that God gave Moses a pattern for the tabernacle and a pattern for the garments of the priest and a pattern for the anointing oil that was used to anoint every vessel that was in uh, the place of worship. It is this word anointing, and I'm no Hebrew scholar, and so I know my theologue friends that are on the platform might correct me afterwards about the pronunciation of some of these words, but look at somebody and tell them, I, I just need to know I'm anointed. Uh, the Hebrew word is a word uh, that comes with two references in mind. The first reference is of a verb. It has the connotation behind it that when one is anointed, there is a smearing process that happens in the life of the believer. You'll remember that prior to the days uh, of having Maytag and, uh, and having uh, uh, all of the refrigeration that those days they used salt as a preservative and they would rub it in the meat. Uh, without it, the meat would become rotten and unfit for human consumption. And the problem with us that if we don't get the anointing, we will be unfit for each other even in the house of God. We've got to the place now where it seems like folk wonder if there's any difference between us and others that are in the world. We've got some mean folk in our church. We got some rude folk in our church. Look at some and tell them what they really need is the anointing. The Bible says that you are the salt of the earth and in order to change uh, your communities and your churches and uh, in order to change uh, the political structures that are in our society, in order to change the activities that happen among us, we need to have uh, the anointing. So not only must you be smeared by God and robbed with the very presence of God, but you must yourself become the anointed. You must move from the experience now to having uh, the application of being uh, the anointed because the anointed should describe who you really are. I know folk in our church today that say they're deacons, but I never see them deaconing. I can't hear nobody in here today. Choir members who frolic through the tulips as opposed to understanding uh, that ministry of song is a warfare act and that it's not enough just to, to be a pretty girl or sometimes we see the pretty boys around, but that's not the will of God for our church. God says that even being effeminate, there are no soft men in God's army. All right, I got to move on. I'm about to get in trouble here. Look at somebody and tell them, you got to be what you are. Got teachers that have stopped teaching in our church and living on the experience of last year. Haven't picked up a Bible in weeks and months and using a gift. The gift is not the anointing. 
You got to work your gift, but you got to submit the gift to God so God can anoint you. We've gotten to the place now that even in our church, the apostle Paul would argue to the Hebrews and declare, for when the time came that you should have been teachers, now you have need uh, that we teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. The day has come that we should be teaching other things and deeper things. And not just worrying about if the skirt ought to be here or here. I can't hear nobody in here today. Look at somebody and tell them you cannot be lazy and be anointed at the same time. I may not tune up today, but I declare I want to come through here for a moment. Since I'm in trouble, let me get in trouble with some of others in here. We used to sing a song, and, and God, I hope none of us wrote it, and if we did wrote it, I'm sure there's something in it that means well, and it had the right note. Uh, but I, uh, Attorney Henderson, I was... I was wrestling, listening to one of the songs that we used to sing years ago, and, and the words go something to effect, anointing, anointing, fall on me, anointing, anointing, fall on me, let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. And, and I started wondering, I said, is that all I need? To be in the right place when the Holy Ghost falls and it means I'll be anointed? Then how come it is that we can be in the same place, hear the same word, and folk can walk out of here still mean as the devil? I can't hear nobody in here. They heard the same gospel. They heard the same song. They, they heard the same prayer. And some walk out different and others seem to still have some issue. I want to argue that the reason for that is that the anointing is not just an episode. It's not just an event. It's not just a showing up at a place. It's a process. And God knows, you'll see in a minute, it's the pace that will get you in trouble. No matter your reason for being here in St. Louis, I, I came to tell you for a few moments that God's in the process of qualifying some of you for the anointing. He wants to anoint you. But there's a process and there's a pace all of us are going to have to deal with you remember that uh, in the book of Esther there was a young girl by the name of Esther came to the forefront actually she came to the forefront because someone else didn't do their job and she prepared herself for what the future would hold she's in the king's palace when there is a, uh, a scheme given out by an evil man against the people of Israel and it is her uncle Mordecai that comes to her in this day and declares unto her, Think not within thyself that thou shalt escape more than all the other Jews. Just because you're in the king's house, that God has not brought you to a place of leadership not to exercise judgment in the house. And, and sometimes I think we struggle with this because when we get promoted, we carry the vision of the old leader when if it was their vision, they should have stayed in office. I, 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 just, I just said something there. And that's why when we see leadership come into place, Bishop Blake's vision is not just a vision of the old. It builds on the old, but it should expand us to move into areas that we have never considered ourselves. And Mordecai says unto her, listen, don't you think that because you in the holy convocation with the church of God in Christ that you're going to escape what's going on on the outside? You have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You've not come just to wear your glad rags. You've just not come so you can eat in good restaurants in St. Louis. You've not come just to see your friends. You've come because God is taking you through a process that you can be qualified for the anointing of. Some of us need direction. Some of us need correction. Some of us need inspiration. Some have come because their bodies are sick and they need to be healed. Some have even come because there's a need for the turning of the captivity that is found on the inside. And God has purposed that this week you would become the anointed. 
I don't have much time. I got to finish this here. Uh, when you look at the text in the book of Exodus, you'll notice something from the historical narrative. There, there is a, a narrative that establishes for us uh, the setting of which the text is written. Uh, we know that the children of Israel have already gone to Mount Sinai. They have been called out of the land of bondage. And the Bible tells us the old story of them crossing over the Red Sea. Red Sea, that was the sign of their salvation or deliverance. But many of us get stuck before we get to the next body of water. Because you're going to have to learn how to mature. We live in a day now where we ask God for miracles every day. When what God is saying to us that you need to exercise your faith. Uh, and so the people were sent into a time of testing uh, and they saw the move of God among them as the Holy Ghost operated uh, in a pillar of cloud by day and even a pillar of fire by night. But yet in Exodus 14, they have not yet received uh, the anointing. Uh, God miraculously provided for them at a place called Merah where they found uh, the bitter waters there but yet God made them sweet uh, but still uh, no anointing. Uh, in the wilderness of sin uh, be between El Elam and Sinai they complained against Moses and Aaron and wished that they had died in uh, their wilderness or bondage experience. God still gave unto them uh, every morning quail uh, on toast uh, and yet they still uh, did not have uh, the anointing uh, they murmured and complained uh, at a place called Rephidim where they had no water to drink and God led Moses now to smite the rock uh, to give his children uh, drink in uh, their experience then came uh, the Amalekites there the Bible tells us at Rephidim where they warred against Israel uh, attacking the women and the children but still uh, no anointing uh, you recall that in numbers chapter number 20 as israel was in the desert of zen uh, the bible says that their miriam died and the people were again without water and gathered themselves together against moses i wonder why it is that when people are not successful they blame leadership when they're successful, they take the credit for themselves. But when things don't go their way, they always seem to turn against leadership. Why blame the leaders for something you didn't do? Why blame them when you're the one that hasn't labored before the Lord? Why blame them when, in fact, you were encouraging them to take you to a place that you had never been before? The Bible says that they're with Moses uh, uh, they were brought to this place uh, just as we have been brought to St. Louis the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the mountain watch this thing for just a moment uh, in numbers 20 the Lord said I hear the chiding of my children and tells Moses go down there but this time don't strike the rock speak to the rock because my children need uh, some water but somewhere between God and the solution, they met up with the wrong kind of people. But the Bible declares that Moses and Aaron found some other folk and began to talk to them and said unto them, must we, as if they had done it, fetch water from this rock for ye rebels? And God said unto them, because you have failed to sanctify me in the eyes of the people. Y'all got to catch this one. Because just because we got the microphone. And just because we have the authority. Does not mean that we are to make the people feel. As if God is angry with them. God wants to bless you. Look at some of them. God wants to bless you. After all God has done. After all God has sacrificed, after all God has provided, this was the argument that Paul would make to the Roman church as he stair steps his thesis in the book of Romans. It is Paul that argues in Romans chapter number 12. I beg you, I beseech you, brethren, after all I've written to you about what God has done for you, I told you he loved you when you didn't love yourself. I told you that his love was meted toward you 
you when you weren't even searching for him. I told you that there was none that seeketh after God. No, not even one. But God kept loving you. And I'm begging you. Touch somebody and tell them, I got to beg you for a moment. I don't intend to feel as if I'm needy, but I've got to beg you. Because God has brought you to a place that you've never been before. God has brought this church to a place where it no longer has to borrow money in order to have its convocation. After all I've done, somebody ain't catching this. You got to think about how far God has brought you from and understand that if God could do that, then there's more in your future. As Bishop would say, I see you in your future and you look much better than you do right now. There's a danger. Look at some of them. There is a danger. There's a danger when we misrepresent uh, God's pleasure toward his people. Uh, for the Bible said, I hear the chiding. That was God saying that. Uh, I know they're murmuring. I know they're complaining. Uh, I know some are saying uh, that the music is too loud and others are saying it's too low. Uh, some are arguing that it's too hot in this place and others are declaring uh, it's too cold. Uh, some are saying that we don't have enough church in the convocation uh, while others are saying, I wish they didn't have so much going on but look at somebody and tell them you got to know what you really need he is the anointing so the Bible declares that that for 40 years, and I'm getting out of here in just a moment, that Israel murmurs and complains. They rebel and they attack leadership. They build golden calves and idols until God decides, I'm going to fix this. And so he brings them to Kadesh Barnea. And they began the process of being able to see what God has for them. But they spent their time going around in circles. They walked in circles until the older generation died because God is going to honor his word if he declares I'm going to bring you out then touch somebody and tell them it's a done deal God said it and that settles it no other nation was given the kind of attention that Israel has been given and church of God in Christ no other Pentecostal organization has had the favor of God and the attention of God as we have had and God is not determined that we should grow old and fail in the path in which he has brought us God's got a purpose y'all sit down for a moment I'll get in God's got a purpose and his purpose is he chose them they did not choose him I can hear John declaring you have not chosen me but I chose you and I ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain every one of us is designed to be productive in this world you're designed to be a winner you're designed to have dreams you're designed to go forth together look at somebody and tell them I'm exceptional I may not look all that you think I ought to look but God says I'm special I'm particular I'm a chosen generation and I've come to tell you that the days of being being ignorant in the church should be over because God has no spiritually retarded folk in the church I feel like preaching now and to be retarded simply means that there's something that's impeding your progress there are those of us that are in the house we're wearing the right kind of clothes but there's something that's clothing our heart that's not right we smile with others and talk about them in their face we're the ones that are putting stuff on the internet I'm not scared of nobody in here we're the ones that put up stuff and can't prove none of it look at somebody and tell them you ought to stop that foolishness I got to get out of here I might need some help on that organ here in a minute look at somebody and tell them you need the anointing ah God is always wanting you to grow in grace and in knowledge and so the Bible tells us that in the book of Exodus he begins the process now of dealing with the sacred sacrifices or the offerings the sacred persons or the priests, the sacred days and seasons or the Sabbath 
the sacred things, uh, the tabernacle, and the things uh, that are contained therein. But the one thing I want to tell you about today is the priesthood. I'm not going to worry about the Sabbath and uh, worry about the offering. I want to talk about us because the Bible says that we are a royal, a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And that as prophets, uh, we have a process in our lives. Look at someone and tell them process and pace. And I'm out of here after these two points. The process involves the times of testing. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, there is therefore now no temptation, no test, no trial that has come upon you that you are able to bear. He's the only God I know that will walk over to you and measure where you are and said there's no trial that shall exceed you. And so everything I bring your way, you are destined to be victorious. You are destined to overcome. You are destined to be victorious. Look at somebody and tell them it's a tailor-made test. I know you got your tailor-made suits on, but there's a test that's been tailor-made. And God has declared that you are more than able. It's the test. It's the waiting. It's the trusting. It's the not understanding. It's the being abused. It's the being used. It's the brokenness. Look at somebody and tell them it's a test. It's God. God, working the process and the problem I have is that how can I get messed up in the hand of God but I was reading the testimony of a man in Jeremiah where he said the vessel became mud in the hand of the potter look at somebody and ask them how in the world can you get messed up in God's hand how in the world can God make a mistake? How in the world can your life be turned around? But the Bible says that when the vessel became marred in the hand of the potter, it was God that said it became his pleasure to make the vessel again. When my life, I feel like preaching now, you got to learn that when you're on the wheel, ha, learn ha, that when you're going through trial, ha, learn ha, when folk are talking about you, ha, the one prayer you got to pray ha, is not get me off the wheel, ha, but you got to tell the Lord, ha, Lord, ha, keep your hand on me ha, because I'm spinning out of control. Ha. Keep your hand on me ha, because my mind is in trouble. Ha. Keep your hand on me. Ha. Somebody say, Lord, ha. keep your hand on me. Ha. When life comes, ha. keep your hand on me. Ha. Now the process ha, is not the pace ha, because sometimes ha, it's the pace ha, and not the process ha, that gets us in trouble. Ha. Can I run back to Jeremiah ha, where the Bible said ha, that once he made the vessels, ha, he took those vessels, ha, put them on a shelf ha, where they began a drying process. Ha. It was Jeremiah ha, that had to wonder ha, and I'm going to help a preacher now ha, because when you read the book of Jeremiah ha, I fail to see ha, where there's one recorded ha, convert in his ministry ha. God said to him ha, that when I called you to the ministry ha, I told you to pluck down ha, I told you to lift up ha, I told you ha, that they look at your face ha, and wouldn't have any shame ha. look at somebody and tell them ha, looks like the church member ha, sitting next to me ha. no matter how hard my, pre my pastor preaches ha, it seems like ha, there's no shame ha, no blushing ha. well these vessels ha, that have got marred on the wheel ha, 
these vessels ha, that have been made again, ha, these vessels ha, that are set on a shelf ha, and seemingly ignored, ha, there's a second fire ha, that has to come their way. Ha, look at somebody and tell them, ha, think it not strange ha, concerning the fiery trials ha, which are to try you ha, as if some strange thing has happened. Ha, it's normal ha, for folk to talk about you. Ha, it's normal ha, for folk to lie on you. Ha, it's normal ha, for folk to undercut you. Ha, but the one thing you gotta learn ha, is you got to learn ha, to count it all joy. Ha, look at somebody and tell them count it. Count it all joy ha, for the trials you go through. Ha, count it joy ha, for the pace you go. Ha, for the Bible says ha, in the book of Deuteronomy, ha, I led you this way ha, that you might know ha, what's in your heart. Ha. I already know ha, you couldn't handle the short path. Ha. I knew ha, you couldn't handle the demon. Ha. I knew ha, you needed to go another way. Ha. And so God ha, led them another way. Ha. God ha, led them a longer way. Ha. God ha, led them a better way. Ha. Lift up your head, ha. O ye gates, ha. be lifted up, ha. ye everlasting door. Ha. And the Bible says ha, that the King of glory ha, shall come in. Ha. Who is the King of glory? Ha. The Lord strong and mighty. Ha. The Lord mighty in your battle. Ha. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. Lift up your head. Your anointing is not just to preach, teach, and sing. Your anointing is destined for the man that lives in obscurity, whose one job is to keep the fire burning in the place of worship. That's what you've been anointed for. You've been anointed for the trial you're in. You've been anointed for the trouble you face. You've been anointed to fight the demons that come your way. You've been anointed. Come on, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Come on, tell somebody, I am the anointed. Just don't thank you to come in here and get a word yes, and a song. Stop in the war room where the prayer warriors are. Don't come in with your titles and your positions. We'll honor you in spite of it. But just lay out before God and say, God, this is something I've been anointed for. That's why I don't fool up with folk who who lie on me. Yes, sir. Tell them, you just helping my strength. Yes, sir. Keep on lying. Yes, sir. I have purpose to live a life that if they ever tell you the wrong lie, you know they're lying. Yes, sir. It's a process and it's a pace. Every head bowed. I'm out of time. Pace been killing some of y'all. You've been wondering when's it gonna be over? How long do I have to be the only one that shows up at prayer? Stay faithful under death. The Lord is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love Amen. and that you minister to the saints. Father, I pray for this house. I know this is an unusual word, but for some, the process has got them spinning and others, they don't understand why so long. 
I pray that even in this hour, you'll help someone understand the wilderness was never designed to kill Israel. Only designed to kill everything that was not related to faith. Cause your people to look up. Trust you in this hour. This